I'm not as good looking as the original moderator. So I got a plenty of notice early this morning that, to moderate this session. So please excuse me if I'm a little uh, off. But um, it's my pleasure. Um, she is unable to make it because um, she's in the um, in DC, I believe. So Ricardo, I, I promise not to embarrass you and not go rogue too much. For full disclosure, Emma is my wife, um, so I don't hear it afterwards. Um, but I'm glad to shift gears from an interesting morning where there seems to be a lot of priority on power and money. And one of the speakers mentioned that, and I, can't, and I won't call you out because I, I can't remember who, that we have to put the profits first and startups and we really got to keep a, looking at the bottom line. I would push back on you gently um, and let you know that there's some of the most profitable companies, some of the most powerful companies, can also do it in a manner that is well balanced, that provides its stakeholders with profits, but also at the same time are a positive addition to the community at large. And I think if we lose that thought and we put money before everything else, because that's what money and power does. You want money, I want power, I want the bottom line. That's great, you're gonna have war, you're gonna have chaos. I'm fortunate enough to, to be able to moderate this session with people that are extremely intelligent. What you have up here is representation from Columbia, from Oxford, from Wharton School. So these are, these are the people that are helping change the world. I know they're doing it on the profit, but they're also doing it on the nonprofit, on the humanitarian side. So um, without further ado, um, we're gonna open this up. Now, interestingly enough, the topic of this is from human to humane. And I know that I was given a schedule to talk about and introduce children of war, but, and, and we will, but from human to humane, when, when we think about it, um, when we think about it, at least when I think about it, and I, and, I, and I ask you guys, going from the session of money and power and money and profits and entrepreneur and seed capital and shifting gears, um, I'd like to you're, you're each just introduce yourself. Like, give us your one line, two line, maybe you know, two three minute perspective. What, what, what does that mean to you? Human to humane, emergency response, and long term commitments. Um, because I think the title is very intriguing. Because humans in general, no matter what they tell you, want money and power. Whether we're talking governments, dem democracies, dictatorships, corporations, they want money and power. So. This is a great shift, and, and I look forward to, to, to helping with that transition. So um, we'll, we'll just go, we'll start with Tom, and I, I'm gonna change gears. I know I was given to introduce children of war and everything, but look, what does that mean to you, and, and we'll work our way. Well, you know, when we were talking about uh, why do foundations give money? First of all, it takes somebody who's made money to put money into a foundation. And the reason they put money into a foundation is that most reasons are they want to give back to the community where they had the opportunity to raise their families, to support their church, support their community, and also to give back. So that's what the Anthony R. Abraham Foundation is all about. And our mission has been very clear, to help the poor, the helpless, and those in need, to help educate the next generation who will lead this country. Great. Serena, I, you know, I, I don't want to, she told me a lot of things I can't say about her, but she's an international security professional, so I'm convinced that, I don't know what that means other than she's done, she's a multilateral diplomacy and uh, advocate uh, in Geneva, right? Um, what, what, is that, what does that mean to you, human to humane? Um, and then we'll, de we'll, del we'll dive deep into, you know, the, the rest of the session. Sure, thanks so much. I think, um, well, in addition to what Thomas has just said, I would say when we're talking about human, there's a, a lot about the nature of humanity, the tendencies, the needs that need to be attended to. And when we move to humane, we're talking about the application of focus and intention with an end objective of a certain type of impact. So I would say that the conversation that we're going to have on this panel, I think, and I'm really happy that we were able to connect uh, previously with these wonderful panelists, is really to see how we can really leverage the kind of success that is sitting in this room, both financial and otherwise, in order to actually streamline impact and make a big difference. Maha, 
By the way, Maha told me I, when I met her this morning, and I said, where are you from? She said, the center of the world or universe, which immediately meant to me Dearborn, Michigan. And I said, Dearborn, Michigan? She said, yes. And she's Palestinian like myself, so please. Well, I um, want to start by uh, thanking everybody on this panel. I'm honored to be in the midst of such uh, a great, great philanthropist. And I want to thank the uh, Takrim group for bringing us together. And I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be here today. Um, and I hope that we will manage to draw from the collective wisdom that uh, has been shared throughout the day and go home with something that we learned that will make us make something different tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, so, so for me, uh, human to humane really has to do with um, you know, the power of philanthropy, um, you know, from my perspective, it's, uh, philanthropy is about giving time, talent, and treasure, right? But it is about the bottom line of it that it allows the person to be self-expressed. It allows the person to do something about an important cause that they care about. So it is the ultimate humanity when you are able to do and improve communities and, and affect a cause that is important, that happens to be important to you. And yes, maybe we, you know, we are humans, so we react a lot of times to, um, uh, you know, certain disasters that happen in the world, but, but the ultimate, ultimate real effect of anything that has to do with philanthropy is our ability to focus and to understand what it is that we care about really and to be strategic about that impact that we want to make through our philanthropy because you know when we react to things that lasts for five seconds but the bottom line of the work that we are trying to do through the Center for Arab American Philanthropy is to make philanthropy a way of life that we can affect a great deal by being really strategic when it comes to our giving. And the name of the game is how do we make that as part of our life and not only reacting when something bad happens. That's what I would like to talk about in the future. So, Amal, um, your nonprofit, Children of War Foundation, um, that was number one that I was supposed to start with, and I went slightly rogue on it. But I think it, it does have some relevance. And of course, there's Children of War Foundation on the nonprofit, and then you have Medgeo on the for profit. But on, for this session on the nonprofit, you know, emergency response to me is when I come home and we've got kids from Afghanistan and we've got kids from the Middle East. I mean, our house is a small refugee camp. But the, I mean, they want to know about children of war and what's going on in, you know, obviously in Ukraine. Th these are recurring themes. So, um, and it doesn't seem like there's ever really been a solution because you know, I've got my own thoughts, which we could open up into, but it doesn't seem like a solution. But why don't you just tell everyone a little bit about children of war and, and what, what that means to you, human to humane. With children of war, uh, before I kind of dive into how it started, I, I want to make mention that um, everyone involved with the organization since 2010, myself, all of our doctors, educators, trainers, families, um, they have been involved not only by providing support through um, donations, but also providing that support through their expertise, their time, rolling up their sleeves, bringing their network in so that we're able to mobilize teams and get the work done. Um, and, and that truly makes us kind of one of these grassroots organizations. Um, and we feel like we are the, the minnows uh, in the pond of philanthropists and donors and big, big, fancy corporate um, nonprofit organizations. Um, and I've been, over the past 10 years, I've, I've been asked by uh, certain funders and, and university endowments and academic institutions to take the organization um, you know, to a more corporate um, or more institutionalized level. And I didn't want to do that because I felt like I could t 
have more reach and more impact um, by being able to go out and do the work that we know needed to be done um, and not by having to go out and chase where that new grant money was coming in, right? Or, um, or follow these trends that we all know we have to make impact with one program and then go off and chase the next pot of money to start another program and keep hearing sustainability and sustainability and um, that just it, it won't happen um, if if the way money is being um, delivered um, I, I don't I don't think um, sustainable sustainability will ever come out of that and then to answer your question about um, children of war when, when I started Children of War, it wasn't my intention to, um, to go out and start a nonprofit. I had no nonprofit experience besides volunteering um, a few times. And in this one opportunity, I, um, at a time where I was just coming out of a spinal cord injury, um, I was looking to get into volunteer work, and I had an opportunity presented to help save one boy's life um, who was a victim of a roadside bomb in Iraq. And he needed uh, substantial surgery uh, to save his life. And uh, my husband, who is a, a pediatric plastic surgeon, reached out, um, was reached out to by a doctor and, and um, Iraq uh, asked for help, and then subsequently uh, Jeff reached out to me and said, hey, do you think you can um, get this boy into Jordan and, um, and see if you can get him to the U.S.? And, and I did. I, I said, yeah, let's do this. And I flew to Jordan, and then from uh, Amman, I brought him to, um, from Baghdad to Amman, and I literally lobbied in front of the U.S. Embassy for three days begging them um, to give him a visa to come to the States so that he could get the care that he needed before he died. And that's essentially where Children of War started. Um, the name Children of War was based off of this nine-year-old boy, Hashem, who's now 19 years old and in university in Turkey. Um, and, and from that, just from that one boy, uh, I felt really empowered and um, I felt like I could offer something to so many other people um, that you know, could utilize the network that I had because at that time I, you know, I couldn't support the organization financially. Um, but what I could do was reach out to my network, reach out to doctors, hospital institutions, um, and everybody offered something um, that could help, you know, these children that were reaching out to us. And over the years we, we went from one child to multiple children at a time to mobilizing medical missions and then morphing into bringing in education and training and um, and now um, in the during COVID we've implemented a lot of remote type technology to train um, to interact to teach um, uh, kids on the Syrian border data science with women in data science in Stanford um, we have a first of its kind high school remote education program in Jordan uh, for refugees that would otherwise not have access um, to high school education. Um, and, and like I said, it's just kind of morphed into this whole other entity, but our impact is substantial. Um, we've, uh, and, and in part too, it's me uh, not being, you know, controlling over it, but wanting just to stay true to why we started the organization, uh, why, uh, and, you know, taking what fell into our lap and continuing to do it for the same reason. Um, and, you know, almost 12 years now, we've provided over 20,000 surgeries to kids all over the world. Um, and, and if you look at our, um, our budgets and, and whatnot, um, you'll, you'll know that those those monies and that funding would have ne wouldn't have even covered a quarter of, of the uh, services that we provide, and and that's really you know uh, due to having partners and supporters, and um, and being able to work with big institutions that have endowments that can support your overhead costs when you're shipping large medical equipment or mobilizing teams. And that's really, um, that's been key to, to what we've been able to do in the past 12 years. Um, 
and I think I'm just going to, I don't want to hog the stage from you, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, Charbel, you're the president of Specified Technologies, and then, but you're also involved on the humanitarian side and um, in the, you know, from human to humane. You know, you, Tom said something very interesting. You've got to make money, right, if you're going to give money. And that's true. So how does that play for you in your, in your life, in your corporation, in the profit world, and in the nonprofit world? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so it really all comes together when we have a business experience as well as a um, plan for impact. Um, let me first start by saying that uh, there's a point in your life, sometimes early, sometimes later, where the greatest pleasure comes from giving, not necessarily from getting. Uh, I think it's true for all of us. And to me, the greatest gift is education. Because once you empower people, uh, it makes all the difference in their lives. And we've talked a lot about many types of empowerment here, uh, whether it's in business or in nonprofits. We've talked, we know that there's a lot of money that goes into higher education, a lot of money goes into uh, private schools in Lebanon, uh, like uh, I went to the Jesuits, and you know, there's a lot of money that goes there. But there's very little money that goes into lower education in the public sector and in the villages and all that. And uh, so when we talk about uh, equity, about justice, about wanting to give opportunity, it's really empty talk until we give kids an opportunity. And so Teach for Lebanon, which is part of the Teach for All organization that works in 60 countries, basically we do three things. We um, hire uh, young college graduates, Lebanese kids from Lebanese universities. Uh, and we're very lucky that we have uh, a great choice because everybody's looking for a job in Lebanon we pay reasonably well, and so we have about 1,500 applications, out of which we pick about 50 people. Uh, so we ensure quality. We train these uh, young people, and uh, we put them in schools, in remote villages for a couple of years, where they're going to become not just a big brother and big sister, but also a teacher, a role model. And so you ask some of the kids in those villages, uh, what's your goal in life? What do you want to do? And the first thing they tell you is, I want to be a taxi driver, because that's where you make the most money. Then I want to be uh, you know, a mechanic, a, book, a butcher, whatever. This is what they've been exposed to. Six months later, you ask them, what do you want to be? And they tell you, I want to be a teacher. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a business person. Uh, I want to be a doctor, because by now we've exposed them to a lot more. These are life-changing experiences. So we create jobs, well-paying jobs, and keep people in Lebanon who would otherwise have to expatriate themselves. It's a huge problem in Lebanon right now. We should, I wish we could do a lot more. I would love to have you know, 200 or 300 fellows teaching kids. We impact kids. So far, over the last 10 years, we've impacted about 40,000 kids. And three, we create uh, civic leaders who are you know, young people who are really interested in Lebanon and making a difference. So this is one of the organizations I'm involved with. I'm also involved with another one called the Touch Foundation that works in Tanzania and now is expanding to other parts of Africa. And this is purely medical where we train doctors and nurses, we help build hospitals, and we solve some complex problems with some very interesting solutions using technology. Maybe we'll talk about that later. So that's the bottom line of what... I think what you said is, is critical. Um, jobs and education, and, and we'll, we'll open up. We've got about 23 minutes so we can get this, and maybe we'll save a few minutes for questions. But 
you know, these are the people that are writing the checks. Here's your seed capitalist, your funds, your, you know, your entrepreneurs, and they're writing checks to you guys to, you know, to go provide, whether it's medical care, education. But the truth is, is and, and I'll open this up to you guys, is I was, we, I was talking to a neurosurgeon yesterday, Emil and I were talking to him, prominent neurosurgeon who's been in delivering humanitarian aid for 40 years. And he said, there's no such thing as sustainability. There isn't when you're, when you're going out to just provide emergency response and medical care because of what you said. He said if it was up to him and he had the million dollars and he was in Haiti, that's where he was delivering the care, he said probably the best thing he could have done with that million dollars was start a tobacco farm so he could employ them so then they can build their own hospital. So, and that, you know, that, that's coming from a, a, a surgeon who has, you know, been doing it for 40 years over there, and, and, and he's right on, on point, is that if you just go and you go knocking and these guys write you the check, when I say guys, male and female, of course, well, they write you the check for two, three, four million dollars so you can provide A, B, and C, the truth is that that impact um, doesn't have, to use investor terms, that ROI, that were the return on investment, that multiplier effect. So I'll, I'll, we'll work it. We'll start with Tom and work it around. And I'm being critical because I, I want to provoke the conversation because I'm telling you, yeah, it's not sustainable. You want me to write you a check? All right, here's your X amount of dollars, and okay, I'll get a tax break. That, that, that's what corporate America is thinking in the back of their head. I want to get this guy off my back, and he, great, give me some PR. How do you how do you fight through that? and keep doing what you need to do. Because listen, it needs to be done. There's no one gonna help uh, the kids in Lebanon um, internally at this point. There's no one that's gonna help the Ukrainian kids, the Palestinian kids. It's gotta come from our youth and from our development. So how do you fight that? That's a good question. You know, when you, if you had been here earlier, you listened to the investors and the business guys, they were all talking about, you know, how do they invest in, in new startups? Um, how do we, as a foundation, the Anthony Abraham Foundation, how do we invest in charities and organizations that we believe in? First thing, when they come to us and they ask us for money, I really look at the individuals or the heads of the organizations and I look in their eyes and I listen to their voices and I want to see, do they really have passion? Is this a job or is this something they believe in? Do they have empathy? Do they communicate that to us, that they really care about what they're doing? And then after we review their deck, then I make it a point to actually go to the facilities and, and participate with the organization, walking around, talking to the kids, talking to the teachers, whatever the organization is, and understanding what their real needs are. And then if I have a sense that I can come back to our board and say, you know what, we should invest here, because they are truly an organization that believes in what they're doing. This is not a job. This is about empowering. This is about giving hope. It's about turning on a light bulb in a young child to believe that he has a future. And so when we go to these places, in these organizations, we actually interact with them and we find out who they are, how they act, and then we invest. And I don't say we donate, I use the word invest like a fund. We're investing for the future of that organization to make sure that what they're doing will get the results they're looking for in empowering those young kids or the hospitals, or paraplegics, et cetera, et cetera. And then me personally, I actually get involved with the organizations and keep a pretty close hand on as far as what they're doing and I always say, I can write a check. There's a lot of organizations that can write a check. But what I want to bring to the table is that one little thought, that one little idea that they maybe have not even thought of, that is so simple, that can change the course of their organization. And we've done that over and over and over because we are actively involved. And I think that's important. The investors that were talking earlier, they were talking about, you know, they're looking at the owner of that company. They're investing in him, and that's what we're doing. We're investing in the leaders of those organizations or those charities that really have the passion and the commitment to make a difference in people's lives. 
Um, so that's that's how we uh, deal with it. Yeah, I mean, and that's exactly what I was thinking about. I'm glad you mentioned that. It. It's it's the same exact thing, right? You're you're looking at the per you're looking at the person. Do I believe in that person? Do I believe in their vision? Will they get the job done? Well, you know, there's people in this room that we've flown to their places in Lebanon. Uh, we spent a lot of time in Beirut, uh, in Detroit, you name it, the cities in the United States that we're involved in. Our foundation has uh, two things. We, what we do is we invest in our local community heavily. Uh, we have a great board, education, medical, you name it. We're, we're engaged. We believe in the, you know, the environment. We're very engaged in that. Uh, and then Lebanon. You know, I go to Lebanon. I'll be there in March, again, to make sure that those organizations that we're supporting are doing their job that they say they're doing and that they're making an impact on the individuals that they're helping. I'm being given a signal in the back that we only have three minutes, so what we're going to do is just open it up. I hope, I hope they've intrigued you. Um, all of them do remarkable work. Um, I, I'd like to say one thing, and, and you know, I think that it's important that we're here for a reason. We're here for the love of Lebanon. We're here because Tekrim and Ricardo, who I've spent time with him and been involved with his organization over the years, they're here to come to the United States to send a message. You know, after 9-11, I would believe every, every Arab American in this country had to go through hell and high water to get through the airport security, et cetera, et cetera. And I know I was one of them. You know, to, in every minute that you turn on the TV, you see a guy with a mask on, waving a flag in Lebanon, and people are saying, that's Lebanon. And there was a young lady that was speaking earlier about marketing and, and changing the concept or the perception of Beirut. You know, that was the reason why I got so involved in supporting in every effort we could to change the image of what people perceive Lebanese are or Arabs are. And that the Kareem Awards coming to the United States is a great tool for us to be able to stand up and to be able to say to the world that we have given a lot. Danny Thomas founded the most successful ch uh, catastrophic children hospital in the world. He got together with a bunch of his Lebanese friends. My father was one of them. And now that's the greatest gift that they gave back, the Lebanese community has given back to America, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. We can make a difference. And we need to stand up and step out of the box and don't worry about what people think and what they say, and are you wearing the right clothes, do you got the right jewelry on, et cetera, et cetera. You know. <laughs> and you know, we gotta be able to tell the world that enough <laughs> is enough. <laughs> and that we Lebanese in America and Arab Americans are going to stand up for what we believe in. We're going to show our faces. We're going to invest in hospitals and schools as we've been doing, all the entrepreneurs in the United States that nobody talks about. We need to stand up and be counted and not to be pushed to the back. You know, every time you turn on the TV, what do you see? The Greeks, how great they were. The Romans, how great they were. The Brits, how great they were. You know, Daisy made a mention about the Phoenicians. It's time that we tell our story. It's time that we stand up and really make a difference. We have to take our voice as the diaspora, and we have to let them know, our people back in Lebanon, that they have a choice. They don't have to continue to live the way they've been living for the last 40 years, and accepting what they're accepting. The next generation wants nothing to do with our generation. They want change. We have to help them find the tools and what they need to make change. I'm going to be in Lebanon. I'm sure a lot of other people are going there to participate in helping make the change possible, one step at a time. It's not going to happen overnight. We cannot give up hope. We have to be the instruments. We have to say enough, enough, enough is enough, okay? And we have to be strong and not give up hope. That's all I have to say. Thank you.
Well. <laughs> you have to love that, Ricardo, right? <laughs> he went rogue. It was amazing. So I think we're out of time, right? I'm being given that signal that there's the thumbs up, but we let him go. We'll let him go all, all night if he wants. So that, that was passionate. I loved it. Um, thank you so much. Um, and we'll, we'll see you guys at dinner.